Um, welcome everyone. Thank you for starting the recording. And um, thank you everyone for being here. I know it's a very, very busy time of year for all of us. And we're just, if you're at all like me, I'm counting down the days to the break. <laughs> Although we all love teaching. It's just like, oh man, it's been it's been a wild ride this fall, hasn't it? So welcome to the second in the um, series about implementing evidence-based uh, strategies for mo motivating our adult learners to stick it through to the end, to finish their classes, to finish the program, and go on to um, the next steps of their educational goals. Um, once again, my name is Christy Reyes. Um, I am here on behalf of Lynx uh, presenting to you. I'm an ESL instructor in Southern California. And um, I really, I, I just love this topic of motivating adult learners um, because there are, if you went through the course, there are 11 strategies that are very doable. So today we're going to be diving into some specifics of those strategies. So this is our agenda. We're going to review the themes from the first webinar. Um, the three general themes. We were going to then go to some really specific classroom strategies. So I'm not sure how many of you are actually in the classroom or administrators, but definitely um, if you are just administrators, these are things you can share with your teaching staff. Um, but if you're a teacher, they're tried and true. I've done these things. And um, for the last year, I've only like lost maybe one or two students in my class per term. And, you know, with the follow up, I find out, oh, thank goodness, it wasn't something I did. It's just that their lives were so busy, like all of us, and just the the class was not um, going to fit with their life schedule at that time. So making it transparent to them how they can come back in when things settle a bit is a really important thing. Um, so then we'll also talk about next steps. Um, selecting a strategy that you would like to look into, try out, and um, we'll talk a little bit about action research. Um, we don't expect you necessarily to do the action research, though that would be wonderful because um, a lot of the research behind all of this is a little bit dated, to be honest. So it would be nice to know um, about some specific strategies that you try out and you collect some data on and maybe present at a conference or at least share with your colleagues in your agency. So um, the motivation strategies that we looked at in the first uh, session, um, we're going to briefly review and look at specifics. So the three main themes that we uh, covered in our first session together were um, building students' self-efficacy, as we talked about, a little bit different than self-confidence, more about their feelings of uh having power and ability to do specific tasks related to our courses, for example. Um, having students set goals and the learning environment, creating a learning environment with the principles of andragogy. I know um, in our field, a lot of people still say pedagogy, but hopefully we can shift to the term andragogy because how we teach adults does tend to be different in, specifically in terms of motivation um, because, you know, you know, unlike K through 12, our students are not being forced <laughs> to be in school. They have made the choice. So we're lucky in that. But it, adult learning theories are slightly different in that regard. So we will briefly review the research implications of these three that we covered in the first session, and then take a deeper dive into the discussions of specific ways to implement, the, uh, implement these evidence-based uh, strategies into classroom instruction and classroom practices. So we're gonna start with self-efficacy. And as you recall from the first webinar, self-efficacy is concerned with making the learning environment, our classroom, our program, um, individual tutoring, for example, support students' individual growth in self-efficacy, making them feel through little successes built up over time that they, they can do it. Um, through self-regulation and other positive individual characteristics. Um, also, some of the research implication about self-efficacy says that we should help students seek ways and help them enhance their sense of self-efficacy in literacy rather than just helping them boost their self-esteem. Self-esteem is important. That's wonderful. But when 
what we do have power over is in our instruction, um, scaffolding and making the learning accessible for all students so that they can um, experience success at some level, right? And then also helping students to um, view change in a way that um, through mistakes, um, we learn and um, we can change our mindset and we can be successful. And that really leads to fostering the growth mindset, giving feedback that is realistic and usable to our students. So during the first session, the handout that you received um, and was you know, posted in the COP on the Lynx website and um, I believe was sent out to you afterwards, was kind of a self-efficacy, um, the first section was self-efficacy, a checklist. Like, where are you now um, in terms of these research findings regarding self-efficacy? Do you need improvement in that area? Are you doing pretty, pretty well? You feel good about that? Or are you really a leader in your agency um, in terms of the research implications for building student self-efficacy? So perhaps there may be one area here that you identified as a potential area of growth for you as an instructor or for your agency if you are an administrator. So we're going to be asking you to think about that self-assessment uh, that you did in the beginning to maybe focus in on one area that you can really start to um, delve into and start um, implementing some practices in the new year and measure how well it works for you and your students. So um, self-efficacy is really very strongly affected by one's beliefs about intelligence. Um, so this goes to the work of Dr. Carol Dweck. Um, if you've never seen her TED Talk, it, it was included in the um, course, um, but you can definitely look it up online. Um, her work did um, focus on kids, but um, I have her book. I, I really love it. And I have multiple pages um, earmarked to return to because she talks about how to build growth mindset in oneself, as well as foster growth mindset. If you're a parent, you're a teacher, you're a coach, you're a um, you're a boss. So it's a, it's a really great um, book. I think that um, if you haven't read it, you should check it out. So um, she defines growth and fixed mindset as follows. Growth mindset is the belief that one's intelligence, competencies, and abilities can be developed. We know this is true. Obviously, we see this in our students. And you probably see students that come into your classroom with um, this mindset, and they believe that they can develop and improve. So a student with a growth mindset will have usually has an, uh, an advantage in boosting their own sense of self-efficacy already. On the other hand, I'm sure you like me have had students who come in with the can't and the but and all of the different beliefs that they have been telling themselves about themselves that kind of the, the um, self-fulfilling prophecy, I can't. And yes, you can't because you've never even tried. So fixed mindset is defined as the belief that we are born with intelligence, competencies, and abilities that cannot be changed. Um, in my class, I have a whole lesson about this topic. Um, again, I teach ESL, and they're a little bit advanced, so they can understand these things. And what I have found that sometimes this can be even cultural, that some cultures really believe in you're born to be good at something or not. So we need to change that in all of our students. So a lot of um, people with this fixed mindset, they just tend to give up if they or not even try something new if they think it's going to be too hard and that they're not going to be the best or they're not going to do well. So a lot of times it's it's unfortunate in Carol Dweck's book that she um, gives anecdotes of many people who started out the top of whatever, you know, whatever um, pursuit they had. And then when they got to a larger group, they were no longer the best and they just quit. 
And that's just so sad. So a lot of people with fixed mindset would just rather not do something new or rather not do something at all if it there's a chance they could fail or not be good at it the first time. So fixed mindset makes our students with that, that those beliefs really concerned about being judged. Whereas growth mindset makes us feel like we can improve. We believe in the process of improvement over time. So I want to ask you if you would like to share in the chat. Do you think that mindset is permanent? Is mindset permanent? If you can type a yes or no in the chat. Thank you. Exactly. No, mindset is not permanent. It can change over time. I have another question for you then. And this is a pretty, this is a pretty obvious one, but um, do you believe that mindset is the same or different for different areas of our lives and for our students and for different subjects, math versus English? So same in different areas or different? Thank you. All right. Yes, exactly. So <laughs> I hate to admit, I have a little bit of a fixed mindset in math, <laughs> but oh, I feel really confident and um, I have strong self-efficacy in English. But um, even as a teacher, we need to model to students. So um, a lot of times when um, there's some math coming up in my lesson, I um, I model the, the mindset of, well, this isn't my strongest skill, but I'm going to try, <laughs> right? So we can model that, that self-talk to our students as well. So definitely it is possible to have different mindsets for different areas of our lives. And definitely mindset can change. Um, and we can help students change that as well. So I love this. Um, there's a book by Malcolm Gladwell, um, and his uh, he he looked at different people who are highly successful in many different areas, whether they're CEOs or um, elite athletes and so on. And what he found was um, a lot of different research and a lot of different ideas out there. And some of the research that's cited um, is that, well, first of all, the uh, variety of different lengths of time and um, the effort given, the research does not agree on one thing at all. So numerous studies have been done to find the magic number for the number of hours, days, or years that it takes to become an expert. One study found that it takes 21 days to develop new habits. You've probably heard about that one. So if um, students are trying to get better at a certain skill, we can let them know, get, give it a chance. Do, do, this, do this math problem. Um, I'm gonna give you an, another problem every day for homework for 21 days and you need to spend a little time. So that's, that's what one um, piece of research showed. Another claimed 10 years, another 20 years, another claimed that it took 10,000 hours. <laughs> so I probably wouldn't tell students 10,000 hours because that sounds really daunting, but um, you know they tracked some different people and they found that 10,000 hours of practice they became really excellent at whatever skill they were trying to master. And just to throw that in there, that's sort of funny. Um, the truth is, and it's cited in the Malcolm Gladwell book, that the Beatles, when they were starting off playing in pubs in Germany, they practice every single night in the beginning, seven days a week. And that's where they came up with the song title, eight, eight days a week. So Regardless of how many hours, we know that every student comes into our course with different mindset, as well as different background and different time that they can commit. These studies do have one factor in common. The subjects had given substantial effort sustained through practice over time. So we can provide students this valuable information to help them understand that deep learning does not happen overnight. It takes time and effort. 
So our second theme um, from the first webinar was about using goal setting with our adult learners. And the research is very clear that this is a very effective strategy, but we have to help students with this because they're not always familiar with goal setting. Um, I was in a session last um, spring with some of our learners at our school and it was on goal setting. And one um, older student said, oh no, goal setting is only for younger people. And so I was just, I almost had to like, wow, where did you get that misconception, right? So we really need to help students set proximal goals. They may come in with a goal um, in our classes, like far off into the future. And those are wonderful goals too. But if the goal is not something that they can see progress towards in during the time that they're with us, then they may not see the value in what they're learning in our classes. So if we set a proximal goal for the time that they spend in our classes and provide appropriate scaffolding starting at the skill level that they bring to us in the beginning, so scaffolding with a lot of concept and skill support, they can reach these proximal goals. And once they've re reached one proximal goal, that feeds into this feeling of self-efficacy. Look, I, I attained one goal, why not set another goal? Also in our first session together, we talked about mastery goals versus performance goals. So mastery, the student is comparing their them with themselves, progress over time rather than performance goals comparing with their classmates. So we need to emphasize that maybe with a goal tracking form or something. So going a little bit into more of the research about goal setting, um, this Cummings, look, it's 1999, but um, still really it was a lot larger scale research and it's it was really um, groundbreaking for its time. And I think it still holds true that um, Cummings found that adult learners who have specific goals in mind are more likely to persist in their studies. So rather than just, I want to you know brush up on my math or I want to improve my English, right? So it needs to be more specific and students sometimes have a hard time coming up with specific goals. So that's where we can come into play. So we'll talk about that. Um, the primary incentive to learner retention is the learner, learners be, um, being able to set a goal and realize some progress towards reaching that goal. So again, going back to proximal goals, things that are shorter in time and more attainable. And personal best goal setting results in better initial and continued um, engagement, as well as having a positive impact on student engagement over time. So those are just um, a few more research briefs about goal setting. Um, one other thing about goal setting, and we're gonna practice this in a little bit. Um, specific and difficult goals, setting those goals is effective at increasing behavior cha um, change. So once again, setting specific and challenging goals, not something that's too easy, right? Can change students' behavior. And goal setting is optimally effective when first, it is set face-to-face. So in other words, we have a little one-to-one -one conference for just a couple minutes with students or they're, they're doing, we're giving a little bit of class time for that. Also, um, goal setting can be more effective when it is set publicly. In other words, either we, the instructors or a counselor or a classmate um, is aware of their other classmates goal. So publicly, letting everyone know we'll be more accountable than when we just have our goal inside of our, our mind. When we have when we have written it down and we have told someone about it, there's a greater chance. And then when in, it's a group goal as well, and when the goal is coupled with monitoring of the behavior or outcome by another person, person without judgment to help the person setting the goal be accountable to their, themselves. So there are many ways we could do this. Um, if you have students set goals when they come in during orientation with a counselor, maybe a, a check back in with that counselor now and then, 
Um, I, I feel like that we need to do more reaching out than that, though, because our counselors are often very busy with many different students assigned to them. So it could be us it, um, just having students set the goal in the beginning of class and then giving time maybe once a week. Pull out your goal sheet. How are you doing? Do you need to modify it? Um, a quick check in with the teacher for a minute. How's your goal going? When students are reminded of their goal, they will be take um, greater steps to continue um, whatever steps that they have set up for themselves to reach that goal. So um, these are just some of the different things that are important to keep in mind. Not just having students set goals in the beginning and just put you know put that goal away, but continually returning to the goals. So. In our first session, this was another section of the self-assessment, and hopefully you identified one area for potential improvement. Perhaps that will be something that you would like to focus on. Although I heard from some of you in the first session that some of you do a really great job with goal setting. So thank you. I'm just checking the chat here, Greg. Yes, some students are, it's really amazing how they come in knowing exactly what they want and need, and others, are just sort of wandering, right? So research on data, research data on whether this is the case to the same degree if students develop goals when prompted by a program. I'm sure there is, Greg. Um, I can I can search out that re um, specific research about that and we'll have Hannah send that on to you. Yeah, let me um, make sure to capture that, your question from the chat. Um, yeah, there there is a lot more um, research on goal setting. Um, that's probably a little bit more current than some of the other um, areas, definitely. So thank you for bringing that up. That's a great question. So what usually happens, maybe if you've um, done goal setting with your students, sometimes students have difficulty expressing the goals that they want to attain. Um, like I said, maybe it's a brush up on their basic skills, that's their goal right? But they really maybe don't see what would come next. What, why are they needing this brush up? Someone just told them. So they don't always really see the bigger picture or maybe don't have the ability to articulate the reason behind this. Maybe it's there somewhere, but they just haven't been able to formulate the exact reason for their goal. So for instance, if a student in an ESL or adult basic education English language arts class tells you that the goal is to improve English, how can we help students? That's that's really, I want to improve my English. That's just way too general. So um, we can have a little conversation or if the students are lower level ESL, even provide a list of possibilities for them to choose from. So we can take some steps to help students see, okay, I understand you want to improve your English and how is this going to further you in some area of your life? So as you as you do this, it's really a questioning because you know we don't want to make up the goals for students, but we want to use questioning strategies to help them arrive at the goals for themselves. So we can ask students different questions like, you know, you know, what happened that, did something happen before that you felt like, hmm, I need to improve my English? After you get your GED, was there some reason why you need your GED? What will you do afterwards? Um, so then, you know, someone who says, I want to be a nurse, that's really, um, <laughs> that's a much longer, um, long-term goal to be a nurse, to be a registered nurse, for example, that will take a university degree. So that that is something students would not really be able to see um, progress towards necessarily in our class. So we can help students break down that goal to a more proximal goal. So when a goal like that is so far off and so broad, these questioning strategies and helping students break down um, a larger goal into smaller short-term goals um, will help with the motivation, definitely. So you've probably heard about SMART goals before. I'm sure you have. Um, I've, I've even used this acronym and some, I, 
I believe some schools and some places, the words are slightly different, but basically a SMART goal is specific. It's measurable. It's achievable, realistic, and time bound. And um, if your students are at a language proficiency that they can understand these words, you could even help them understand how to make SMART goals. I have a lesson that I did with my students before, and um, I do have like internationally um, trained professionals and they back in their countries were in charge of helping their their workers make workplace goals and they were very happy to to learn about smart goals so many however many adult learners are completely unfamiliar with goal setting and very few have ever written a smart goal statement i believe right so taking the time to help students formulate a smart goal really does pay off in the long term and i don't mean like necessarily a whole lesson although i've done that not a whole lesson but maybe just a little bit of time in class um, where you talk about what these words mean and help them set the goal, maybe with a goal plan. Um, so I have a handout that I created um, where students fill that out. Thank you. Someone just shared one in the chat. Thank you. Um, so um, having this goal plan and then having them maybe visually chart or log their progress and what they do every week towards achieving that goal can help them be more accountable and um, have more likelihood of achieving the proximal goal we help them set for our course. Um, also, we, we by tracking their goals, then we can ensure that their progress is recognized and praised. So uh, we're going to look at some slides next that show how in conversation with an instructor, some different students in different um, subject areas were able to formulate SMART goals with just a little bit of time given, um, dedicated. So uh, um, a student came in, an English language learner, just says, I want to improve my English. So through conversation, we could find out that they are lacking words. <laughs> they are lacking some foundational words for communicating. So what the teacher came up with in um, guiding the student is this idea of let's help you build your vocabulary. So the student made a SMART goal. I'm going to learn 10 new vocabulary words each week. And the teacher then knew that this was the student's goal. So ensured that vocabulary instruction was given some time in class. Then, with helping the, the student break down that goal into five steps. Like it's a tried and true practice for basic skills, uh, um, study skills, the flashcards. Well, of course they could be something like digital flashcards that students create or the teacher creates on Quizlet um, if, you, if you use that tool. But um, buy flashcards, buy some index cards. Write new words on the cards with the definitions, pictures, synonyms, antonyms, sentences. Practice and ask my family to quiz me. Enter the words and def definitions on Quizlet. Luckily, with Quizlet, um, you can search up. Just with a free account, you can search up, and there, there are thousands of um, flashcard decks already right there. Um, practice and test myself, use the words in class and in my everyday communication. And the teacher could set that up. I, what I've done before is um, going through vocabulary and then say to the students, when, you, when we're having a discussion in class and you use one of the vocabulary words, you get a free pencil, <laughs> right? So rewarding that. And ask my teacher to check my sentences and give me extra practice with some website recommendations or a quiz or sentences for dictation. And then the timeline so that they can see and check off on a log sheet that they did these things, okay? So um, another program area, a student may want to pass the high school equivalency or GED math. They, they passed everything else, but math is the stickler for this student. Um, but if the student came in just with the general goal, I, I need to pass the GED math exam. Okay. Well, let's have a conversation. What's going, what's not going well? What, what are you struggling with? Well, the time, the time, I don't have a lot of time. Okay. 
Will you, you want to pass this test. This is your last test to pass. Let's make time. So I, I don't know about in your agency at my school. Oh my gosh, we have so many students who are, they're just one class away from finishing. And so this little extra push with a, either a counselor's help or a teacher's help gets that final high school diploma in their hands. So the steps that um, the, the student and teacher in consultation with the teacher, the, stu uh, teacher, the student came up with, sorry, ask my teacher for websites or supplemental study materials. Make a personal contract to force myself to study 30 minutes a day, log my time, spend one hour per week doing practice questions, visit, visiting a tutoring center if you have one, um, ask them to check my homework, uh, record my test results on a self tracker, visit the instructor before or after class to ask any questions I may have, and then sign up for that GED math test and take the test and pass, right? So breaking it down to steps that are achievable and doable will help the student achieve that goal. Um, again, this is really a wonderful goal. The student comes into maybe ABE or ESL class and they they want to be a nurse. Well, that's that's really far off. That's a registered nurse. That's a long time from now. So I definitely don't want to discourage the student. So what can we do in the meantime? How about you just explore if this is something that you really want to do and see how long it's going to take you, what you need to do to start preparing now. So steps, visit a counselor. Do I need a high school diploma or GED? What classes should I take now? Maybe there's some specific classes that will help students gain more vocabulary, more experience with that. Um, visit the ONET or other career sites to learn if this is even an in-demand career. How, what Will this career pay what I need to support my family? Okay. Um, three, interview someone to or even job shadow if possible. Find out the requirements for a community college nursing program because that will be on the career ladder. Maybe I need a job now or very soon, and I can't wait for a four-year degree and transferring to a degree. So um, maybe they could start taking some classes just um, to explore that career at the community college. That would be their next step. And then seeing also what they would need if, if they do like that career. Like a lot of college may just have a certified nursing um, program that is much shorter term and the student can start working in that career to see if if that's something they want to do um, at a higher level. And then decide if this career is really for me and meet with a counselor, make a five-year plan. So that takes that, wow, I want to be a nurse in the future, breaks it down into some steps that can be achieved and that the student will be exploring that career and keep that longer term goal still in their mind. So hopefully that gives you some ideas. I'm sure many of you are very skilled at this already, helping your students set um, set goals. But I, you know, you just need to be prepared for anything because we know that our students are very diverse in um, in what they want to do um, with the education they're getting from us. So um, that's a little bit about goal setting. So maybe that's something you want to explore with your students when you come back from the winter break starting off the spring with having them set goals and see and measuring how that affects their motivation and their persistence in the classes that you're teaching. The third area we covered in the first webinar was the learning environment. And I think this is generally something we do so well in adult ed. Um, when we walk around um, many different schools where adult students are being served, we can see the students working together, um, sitting at tables, discussing. So all those things that we already do well, we need to keep doing. But some other things to think about um, the implications from the practice. Based on the student goals, so if we have them do goal setting, then we can choose learning tasks that are optimally interesting and challenging, but realistic, and then provide scaffolding for them to be successful. 
So if I have my students do goal setting and I find out that a lot of students are interested in the nursing career and I'm teaching either an ESL class or maybe I'm teaching um, ABE English language arts, maybe I can bring in some readings, some texts about nursing, what the job is like. So that would be naturally interesting for them because they have already expressed that in their goals. So that would be just one example. Um, we should also try to use deep questions before and after reading to help increase student interest and improve their strategies for constructing arguments and explanations. So um, you've probably, you're probably familiar with the college and career readiness standards and for e um, English language learners, the English language proficiency standards, both of which ask us as instructors to have students go back to the text and um, use evidence from the text they're reading to answer these deeper questions. So choosing texts that have questions or creating questions that require students to go back to the text, because if they can answer those questions without ever having read the text, then that's not a valuable use of their time. They need to be able to be building background knowledge from the text that we choose. And finally, an important thing about the learning environment, and this really relates to the teaching of adult learners. Adult learners really uh, appreciate when they're given choices in their learning activities and about what to work on. So this could be everything from a choice of reading texts. So um, next week, we're going to be practicing um, some reading skills. Would you like a reading text about nursing or would you like a reading text about, I don't know, landscaping or whatever it happens to be, okay? So giving them choices, giving them choices about how to work on whatever um, classroom activities you're having them do. Would you like to work in pairs? Would you like to work in a small group? Would you like to discuss together as a class? Um, what I have seen, um, I'm still a little bit lagging on this, is I've seen some instructors tell students, well, I would like you to pair up, but if you prefer to work alone, that's fine. Respecting that everybody has different learning preferences, um, and even personality. So by giving students choices, that really does has proven to increase their interest and sense of value in a task. And um, I think this is the last part about the implications for practice from the research on classroom environments. Um, when we create a classroom environment that reduces pressure and control, Teacher control over the learning environment is um, one of the strongest negative factors for adult learners. When they feel that the teacher is dictating everything and not respecting the fact that they are adults that can be self-motivated, that can take, um, take some action in their own learning, that decreases motivation. So reducing the pressure and control, increasing safety and student self-directedness so going back to choice of activities and making sure that their the instruction and the, um, the the different activities and topics we're bringing in do relate to their goals, that can all help with the student motivation. Also, when we are providing feedback, giving fine grained feedback, what does that mean? Well, first of all, obviously providing feedback privately. Okay. We know that adults have egos and we don't want to hurt that. Providing that feedback privately and within a short time after students complete a task. So if you're having students take a test, for example, or they've written a paragraph or essay, we don't wait for a month <laughs> to provide the feedback because by then that information has passed on. So students can better use the feedback we give them when they receive it very shortly after um, completing a task. Um, and then last, this is again, going to the you know, self-talk that students do and their, their, um, their, where they come in with either a growth or fixed mindset regarding um, what they're going to be learning in our courses, helping students be conscious of the way they attribute success or failure 
either positive or negative forces um, is really important and moving them towards more positive attributions related to effort, strategies, and learning as a process where errors are natural and expected. We also need to be aware of negative stereotypes that may encourage a student to attribute failure negatively. So the more that we can help students see that failures are a natural part of learning and it's not who you are, it's part of the process that all can help as well. So the classroom environment has a lot of implications here for research. And so um, I, again, I feel like maybe you agree, I hope that we do this already quite well in adult ed, but maybe there's one thing here, when I look at this, I know that something I probably could work on is I'm um, using those deep questions, for example. So maybe you will find something from that section of the self-assessment from the first webinar that you can focus on for going forward. So one more thing to mention um, about the learning environment, um, just a little bit of taking all of that research and putting it into practice. Well, something that can overwhelm or frustrate students and have a negative impact on motivation and persistence is when we give students a very complex assignment without necessary scaffolding. Could you please go to the chat and either define scaffolding in your own words or provide an example of maybe a, a recent assignment that you've had students do in a, a couple of scaffolds that you, you included as part of the instruction to get them ready, to get them prepared for that assignment? So again, what does scaffolding mean to you, if you would like to share in the chat, or can you give an example? Thank you, Lindsay, exactly. Gradual release of practice, gradual release of control, often known as that, that short little um, um, three-part sentence. Um, I do, you, you, I'm, I'm the, you know, I'm kind of the expert, let me, let me model, I do. Now let's all do it together, we do. And now I'm releasing the control to you because we've gone through some steps together Let's let's let you try it. So then um, you do right. Gradual release, exactly. Scaffolding. Anybody else? Scaffolding. I can just share an example of what it, scaffolding is not. <laughs> I remember a really wonderful teacher we had many years ago, and um, we were in the computer lab across the hall from where she, her students were in the computer lab, and students were we're supposed to compose a paragraph right there on the spot. And the, the, we know that writing is a very difficult skill for a lot of students. And she had not go, gone through the necessary um, scaffolding to get them to the point that they were going to compose on a word processing program, their paragraph, right? So with using the writing process, um, brainstorming ideas together, now choose an idea. Tell me what your idea is. Now do some free writing or fill out an outline. Now write your first draft. Let me give you, you know, right. So definitely with anything we do with writing, lots of scaffolding has to happen. So yes, to scaffold an assignment or task, scaffold is like a metaphor that we use. It's starting with some foundation and working our way up with our students. In other words, if you have a very big assignment a paragraph, an essay, a project, something like that. We What we can do as teachers is break it down step by step, just like kind of similar how we help students break down a big goal into little steps, right? So we um, we have do our lesson planning with activities that build in levels of complexity, making sure they understand the foundation before going to the next step. So um, no matter how you're teaching these days, um, I don't know your programs in Florida, whether you're fully face-to-face -face back in person, or if your courses are continuing with some online component, um, that takes a little bit of work when you're teaching hybrid, you know, having those um, activities complement each other, not separate activities online. But it does take some careful planning to scaffold our lessons for our students. First, of course, knowing where our students are 
to begin with and you using a lot of formative assessment techniques so if we're we're teaching the foundation and we realize they still don't have the foundation we can't go up to start building the walls we have to keep working on the foundation right so um those sort of um, things are important to build the foundational um, concepts before progressing onto more complex processes. Um, but again, um, Bandura is the, the researcher who came up with the self-efficacy theory. What he really recommends is offering students frequent opportunities for success in low stakes tasks at the beginning as we work up to more complex and higher stakes assignments. And that corresponds to self-efficacy building in students. Repeated, even if small successes, feed students a um, belief in their ability to succeed. So thank you. Um, I think that was Lindsay. Yes, you brought up the gradual release. Adult educators, We this is what we tend to do. We, we know our students' abilities through some diagnostics as they come into our class, and we use this as an instructional method. So it is a wonderful way to guide our students to independent um, practice and use of whatever we are teaching them. So it helps build autonomy. Another of the nine strategies that really autonomy um, motivates students to persist when they feel some control over their learning. So when we're presenting new content, we may need to be front and center for a time, but with gradual release of control, students gain more autonomy by becoming more responsible and accountable for their classwork over time. So as we release control, then it's no longer teacher fronted, the teacher as a resource, a facilitator, working through tasks individually is what students will be doing. And we're just monitoring and providing feedback as we, we um, move around the classroom. So um, hopefully you use some sort of class routines, um, every some sort of structure in your class. And when we establish routines for our class, like, okay, I'm going to teach you something new, you're going to practice with a partner, and then you're going to do it on your own. That would be a routine. When students can take on more active roles in their classroom management through these routines as well, that can also um, lead to greater motivation. So um, just a little bit more about a couple of the other um, research findings or best strategies that are provided in the course, the online course. Um, so we, when we know students' goals, we know their abilities more or less as they come into our class, then we can make explicit connections between what we're teaching and their needs and goals. Another thing we can do is ask for feedback. Was this useful for you? Does this help you learn? So we can ask students for feedback on the value of the instruction we are providing. And this also makes them feel more empowered in the classroom. Um, you know, Some of our adult learners are not, not accustomed to that whatsoever. Like the teacher is the expert and you're asking me what I think, right? But we should start doing that because that honors the fact that they are adults with experiences who are um, fully capable of giving good feedback. So what exactly does autonomy mean in the adult education classroom? What does it look like? If you could share in the chat if, um, if you feel comfortable, one thing you would do in your class that gives students autonomy. If you can think for a moment, what do you do in your class that gives students some autonomy. It could be something as simple as this. This is what I do sometimes. Um, so my classes are three hours. So um, usually there's a break about an hour and a half in. But if I see, I teach in the evenings and I see that, you know, 
heads are starting to nod <laughs> or they're really engaged, then I ask them, do you want to take your break now or go continue on for 10 more minutes? That could be a simple thing, right? Just letting them choose the pacing of the course. That could be one thing we do for autonomy. Anything else that comes to your mind that you do? Okay, thank you. Great. I love this. Yeah. Thank you, Lindsay. Ask for topics they would like to dis discuss during the conversation hour instead of always coming up with my own topics. I love that, Lindsay. Yes, definitely. So, um, you know, if you, certain courses like CTE, if you're teaching a career technical area, you have things that you have to teach. You just don't have a lot of choice. But if you're teaching, um, many of us teaching language arts or ESL or even math, you know, finding out about students and asking them, well, we're going to be practicing um, this certain skill. What what would you like to do? Would you like to do this on your own? Would you like to work in groups? Would you like to meet with me? And we'll just rotate people around, but also the topics, right? Because we we have that luxury of, especially English language arts, Lindsay, or um, ESL, it's it's the skills. We get to choose the topics, but why not ask students for the topics? I love that. Yes, I, I did that recently. Um, I teach a conversation class like you, Lindsay, and um, before the term began, I sent out um, a survey, a Google form, and said, here are some topics, which, which most interest you? And then every time we're starting a new topic, I say, I go back to their results and I say, well, we're, we're covering this topic in our conversation because you chose it and they love that. So yeah, excellent idea, Lindsay. Um, so when we do give students these learning options, and this comes from the research of Nash and Colin Beck, the New England Adult Learner Persistence Project, um, they looked at agencies throughout um, New England, the, um, the states over there, and they found that um, students who studied more on their own explored more topics than were covered in class and asked teachers to provide more content even. So um, through their research, they found that giving students more autonomy, that there was increased student persistence and course completion rates. So yeah, what you're doing is wonderful. Giving student choices, definitely. Um, let's see what else, what can I tell you about this? One more thing. Well, also just by making sure our instruction is engaging and how do we do that is again, providing choices for class content, but also choices in ways that students demonstrate their learning. Now, of course, maybe your course outline or your student learning outcomes or your, your objectives set were provided to you. Like in my course, students have to write a paragraph, but when I'm not assessing the paragraph, maybe there are other opportunities to bring in student choice. And that could be, okay, well, you wrote a paragraph, we're going to be working on writing skills, but this time, instead of your paragraph, you could do this. You could instead make a video. You could instead make a simple website. You could instead write a song. I don't know. So just different choices like that, because when students can demonstrate the learning in the skill area or whatever modality that they feel they're strongest at, that is again, giving them that autonomy through choices. As long as the choices are not overwhelming, okay? But then they are more self-directed and um, the engagement will increase as well. All right, um, just a couple more things here before we're going to have you do a little bit of work. Um, and um, the next strategy that is in the course is ensuring value in, in instruction. Value is defined as a learner's belief that a domain or task is enjoyable because it's intrinsically in interesting, useful, and important to their identification or sense of self. So Lindsay, asking students, what, what topic do you want for a conversation hour? Exactly. Then they will find value in that conversation hour. In our students' many roles, these adult students that we are serving have many demands on their time. 
And you know, they're they're just like us. They're parents, they they're active in their communities, different organizations, their employees. So value, if they see what we're teaching does not relate to their interests, goals, and needs, that's when they vote with their feet. When they're coming to our class and they just don't see any connection to how this is helping them, a lot of times that's when they, they leave our classes. So we need to make the connections explicit and clear. Students really need to understand the value of the activities and assignments they do in class. Value is vital for persistence. And if, if the value is not clear, of course, that's when the persistence or attendance suffers. So what can we do? First, get to know the students very well. Have them, you know, um, let you know what their goals are. Or take the time to have them set goals for the class. Diagnose what their needs are. And then in that way, when we, when we have that um, information, we can make better decisions about how and what we teach so that our instruction fills the gaps between where the students are now and where they need to be. Another way to ensure that instruction has value is just to ask students for feedback. So um, again, I mentioned like sometimes they're not, they're not familiar or accustomed to giving feedback to the teacher, but again, just asking them, did you, was that an interesting article for you? Um, did, did this particular activity, did you find it engaging? Do you want to do it again? Or how would, how would be, it be better um, productive for you if we were to change it up? How, what do you suggest? They really like that. And then when they see that you implement changes for suggestions, um, trust me, I've done this and they, they've mentioned on um, my evaluation, the student, they said, the teacher asks us what we like and what we need and what is helpful. I love that. That's what a student said on my evaluation. So um, try that if you haven't before. Um, so when you implement those changes, then remind students that you are using their feedback. And then they really feel that this is student driven instead of teacher driven, going back to that control. Okay. So um, just a little bit about feedback. Um, we talked about this previously, but Again, sharing that message that, well, look at look at what your work. There, there were some mistakes, but that's okay. It's all right. That's part of the learning process. Let's let's look at what you didn't get right and let's look where you went wrong and let me help you. Right. So we need to make sure students understand that mistakes are accepted, understood, and part of the learning process. And it's also important that when correcting errors, not to get happy with that red pen and marking every single error that a student has made, for example, on a writing assignment, we need to take a step back and uh, not give exhaustive feedback on errors because that overwhelms and discourages students. What we can do instead is use Carol Dweck's growth mindset suggestions, telling students when you correct an error, your brain is constructing new wiring that will help you uh, make a better choice next time. Making a mistake can actually benefit you if you persist and figure out what, what went wrong and learn from it. So we know that our students may struggle, okay, with both external things that are beyond their control and internal barriers, their negative self-talk sometimes. And um, they can struggle with these barriers to their success in our classes and may even come into our classes with a weaker sense of self-efficacy if they didn't have successful backgrounds previous um, in their educational experiences. So we can use that word that Carol Dweck uh, mentions in her video and in her work, yet. You're making progress, you're not quite there yet. Let's see what you need to do to get to that end goal. So uh, also the end goal is not the end all. Um, remember that instead of just praising the person, oh, you're so smart, no, no, no. And not praising the person, not praising the product, praising students' processes. That's really important to let the student know, look at what you did, look at what you accomplished through practice, study, persistence, and good strategies, rather than praising the person or the product. 
So it's important to carefully construct the feedback. We need to curb our urge to only be looking for negatives in our students' work. We need to give them specifics in a way that is fair and formative with clear instructions on what they need to do next to improve, okay? Here's something that happens um, with some students. Um, this is another strategy in the course of the nine strategies. The students come in with many different ways to excuse failures or negative self-talk. So sometimes if a student does poorly on an activity or assignment, they say they start using the self-talk like, why, why can't I understand that? Why can't I write correctly? Why can't I do this math problem? And they start using this self-talk and they have this, the you know, the fixed mindset belief that intelligence is static. They may have that. And they might start telling this, I can't do this because I'm I'm no good at this. I'm I'm dumb. So what we can do is we can help change those perceived failures and um not not having them be. Um, negative self attributes that affects their self esteem, but instead model ways to reframe their explanations for a mistake or failure and attribute a lack of success to external and controllable reasons or causes. So, for example, we can ask students like straight, what 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 is challenging about this? What what is hard? Let's look at it together. And when a student can verbalize what is difficult then we can provide some alternative language frames. So for example, when a student says, this is too hard for me, then we can say, well, learning is hard. If it were easy, you wouldn't be in the right place. If this is challenging, you are in the right place. We learn when we are challenged, okay? And you can see the others here. I got it all wrong. Well, mistakes are expected. If you if you did it all perfectly, this would be not be the right class for you. You need to be in a, in a higher level, right? So just helping them retrain their brains and use different words and help them change this negative self-talk to a more positive growth mindset way of thinking. Our words, you may um, know this, I'm, I believe you do, our words have great power for our students. So when we can model and help them reframe their explanations, this can affect them in the long term as well. Um, so we know, for example, that um, there are many negative stereotypes about students from who come from many different groups. I don't know if before taking the course or even now you have heard of the term stereotype threat. Um, this this isn't new. It's been around since you know 2010 or before, right? But the work comes from um, Dr. Claude Steele, and he defines stereotype threat as an individual's concern that others in the group will judge them by a dominant stereotype. So he his book is wonderful. It's called Whistling Vivaldi: How Stereotypes Affect Us and What We Can Do. Um, I recommend that book. I I have you know little post its on every few pages. It's a wonderful um, book. Um, it's opened my eyes to many um, many different situations I've had with students over the years. Um, some of the findings, for example, um, that w women perform worse on math tests when they think the test will produce gender differences because of the, the ridiculous stereotype out there that women are not as good at, in math as men, okay? Um, another um, finding specifically related to the academic world that white men perform worse on math tests when they think they're competing with Asians. <laughs> so the stereotype that Asian folks are better at math, it starts clouding students' judgment. So here's just an example from my realm, and just to um, help you think of this. When students come into our um, orientation and fill out a registration form, one of the questions right away is their, what level of education they have. And for some of the students in our program, 
you know, they didn't finish high school. I've even had some students, I have a student right now, she told me she didn't finish second grade in her country. So filling out that bubbling in that two, automatically her mind gets concerned about, oh, now, now this person in front of me and these others here, they see that and they are thinking, oh, she has no education. And her mind will get clouded with the idea that everyone around her, her classmates have this information and it's impossible then to focus. And you've probably, you know, I don't belong in this level. This is what I've heard students say. I don't belong in this level. I didn't finish education. I have low level education. I need to go to the first level. But no, you, you're, <laughs> what I say is no, your placement test said you belong here. And you just, you just used wonderful English. So no, you do belong here. But basically what this stereotype threat is, is when students come into our classroom, they, their mind gets clouded and they start thinking, oh, everybody knows that I belong to this group. And the negative stereotype for this group is X. And their mind gets so focused on being judged that, that they cannot even learn. So there are some great strategies that we can use according to Claude Steele. A couple are just, first of all, with the, the growth mindset, but also we can, um, you know, help students understand that um, intelligence is expandable. So we can also foster group conversations between members of different groups so if you happen to have a class where all students of a certain group are sitting together, breaking up those groups strategically and when they start talking to each other, they realize, oh, actually my classmates do not judge me by the dominant negative stereotype. So fostering those cross conversations can be important through group strategically grouping students in class activities so that groups represent diversity, not having all the students of the same group sit together and work together. Um, informal intergroup talk sessions. When students suffering from the effects of negative stereotype threat, when they realize that others outside of their group are experiencing those same thoughts, then they can start to realize that those stereotypes are not true across the board, right? Um, so interacting with other students. And then another mitigation strategy is, um, I love this one, <clears throat> is sometime in your course, having students, usually in the beginning, affirm their most valued sense of self. This comes from Claude Steele's self-affirmation theory, our, and as well as Bandura's um, self-efficacy theory it lent, lent itself to this, is that the human, the basic human motive is to perceive ourselves as good and competent. And if we don't meet that expectation, we start looking for explanations, trying to guard our self-integrity. And some people then start to project their low performance on their sense of self. So instead, what we can do is have students reflect on their values, um, the values that are personally relevant to them, having them write about their values, talk about their values, and then they start thinking of their positive values right off the bat when they're in our classes rather than thinking about the judgments that may, usually not even, right, but that they think judgments that others are making um, of them. Finally, um, another theory that Claude Steele recommends to break this um, stereotype threat is help students develop a narrative about the setting that explains their frustrations and projects positive engagement and success. So for instance, in his book, he described how, um, you know, he had students um, from Stanford University, um, they were a group of Black students, went to visit um, a classroom and give a presentation about you know, look at me, I'm in college. If I can be, you can be too. And so things like that. Um, so here's one thing that I, I saw in my classroom, going back to that stereotype about women performing worse on math, uh, just not being as skilled, that that um, stereotype threat that can start to um, 
impede women's um, thoughts about themselves in math. Um, I shared a classroom with a math instructor from the community college. I think it was a statistics class. And I noticed that he put this very large poster on the wall. And it was um, a poster of women who had won Nobel prizes for math. And I didn't know anything about stereotype threat. This was more than 10 years ago when he did this. And I thought, wow, that's kind of cool. I wonder what the background. Now I know <laughs> that um, every time the female students would walk into the classroom to sign in and they would look up there and they would see something that was contradicting the stereotype threat that they were perhaps feeling. So those are some ideas. Uh, I really recommend the book though. Um, it's a great read, Whistling Vivaldi. Okay. Oh, and I actually, well, here are those. <laughs> I forgot to advance the slide. These are the steps um, that um, Claude Steele recommends that I was just talking about. So those are different ways we can break stereotype threat or at least mitigate it. All right, so we're coming. Uh, thank you for your endurance here, everyone. Let me check the chat. And Shanice is sharing something. Thank you so much. Oh, I love that. I'm going to have to download that, Shan um, Shanice. Thank you for sharing that. Okay, and I see um, Shanice, man, I love it. I show learners the video and picture below to combat stereotypes and low confidence. I'm opening this right now. I love this. Thank you, Shanice. Please continue to use um, the chat as a back channel to share what resources and strategies that have been working for you. Now, um, what I'd like you to do, we've gone over a lot of different um, strategies within those three themes that we were looking at in the first webinar. And what I'd like you to do is to find your annotation. So how you do this, I believe it's changed in Zoom in the last couple of months. You're going to look for the um, for the toolbar, the Zoom toolbar, and you will see you are viewing, I believe it will be Giovanna's screen, okay? You are viewing, so you're going to go and find the toolbar, um, the green toolbar, and it says you are viewing somebody's screen. Select where it says more or view options, view options. And from there, you should see annotate, okay? And it may look like a little pencil. I think it just depends on if you have your Zoom um, settings updated to the latest version. So find the annotate. And if you have any trouble, of course, you can just type in the chat. Okay, so we've gone over some specifics of these different um, three themes, more practical strategies to implement into the classroom, um, like providing feedback to build growth mindset, goal setting, scaffolding, providing greater learner autonomy and choice, helping students find value in their instruction, assisting learners in managing errors, Reframing explanations. So students said something negative, change that negative statement into a growth mindset statement. Mitigating stereotypes. What is one strategy or two would be okay. You can annotate by, um, by putting a check mark like that um, in the area, or you can type in the chat if you prefer. Thank you, Hannah. Um, Hannah, let us know that um, to annotate, you go to um, the green toolbar, you are viewing Christy Reyes's screen, view options and annotate, okay? And it's likely at the top of your screen where you say you are viewing. And then um, a toolbar, and the latest version of Zoom opens up on the left side. And from there, you can choose a check mark. You can choose T for text if you want to type in something. Um, what else is there? When you, when you choose the check mark, you also see star or heart or arrow as well. So, so far, um, someone is interested in exploring further goal setting. 
we see helping students find value. Um, so go ahead and take a moment to, this is, you know, this is not etched in stone, um, but which one kind of stands out to you as, hmm, I would like to learn more about this, or I would like to even try this out with my students. I would like to see how this works, or maybe it's something I need to improve. So for me, I, I definitely know, I it's just hard finding the time, but I know I need to set aside time for student goal setting. All the research is just pot, you know, pointing to that. And I've done it before, but now I need to return to goal setting. So that's my that's my personal professional goal for 2024, include student goal setting. So how about you? Give you just a moment, helping students find value. This looks good. Okay, give you just about another moment. All right, reframing explanations, yes. And scaffolding, wonderful, thank you. All right. Okay, so I think I'm gonna go ahead and clear the annotations and we're gonna move on. Um, so perhaps one of those that you checked will be part of a goal that you create for yourself um, for the coming year. So we're gonna talk about the next steps. Um, so our next steps, um, We've taken a deeper dive into the how of implementing some of the evidence-based strategies for boosting students' motivation in those three themes that we were exploring in the first webinar, self-efficacy, goal setting, and the learning environment. And what we, um, what we saw in the research is that when goals are set face-to-face, -face, publicly, they're group-oriented and monitored by a peer, or teacher, the result is a higher likelihood of the goal being achieved. So guess what? With that in mind, <laughs> we're going to take some time to in the final part of this webinar for you to make a goal for yourself if you're an instructor in the classroom or maybe for your agency if you are an administrator. So you, you checked a tentative area, a tentative strategy that interests you. And what I'd like to ask now, if you can share in the chat, how many of you are familiar with action research? If you can type yes or no. No worries if you're not at all familiar with action research, but if you are, um, even better, but go ahead and type yes or no in the chat. Are you familiar with action research? Okay, Greg says yes, we have a couple no's. Okay, you you do it, but sometimes you don't realize it <laughs> and you, because you're not doing it formally. If you're in the classroom and you try out something new, that is action research without the data collection necessarily. You're collecting maybe data by walking around and observing, but action research would just take it a step further and that you would collect the data or evidence and do more reflection. I know that we're all very busy teachers. You try out something new and then you're driving home from class and you're probably doing that reflection without knowing that this is action research. So um, I'm not sure how many, Greg, maybe you have participated in action research. You were the one who is familiar with it. Um, this is a way to systematically analyze a problem or issue. So if you found that student motivation is low or students are dropping after the third or fifth week of instruction, that may be the problem. So you can review what's been done in the past. You set a baseline or goal. You take some action based on evidence-based best practices, collect some data or evidence to see if that works or how it doesn't work and could be changed and reflect on the meaning. So these are the um, practitioner action research main steps. You identify the issue. 
you formulate a research question, plan an intervention, observe and collect data, and reflect on the results and draw conclusions. Practitioner action research is not these things though, not what we are doing informally. It's a little more structured. It's not just informally thinking about how a lesson went wrong. We all do that, right, already. It's not just problem solving, but it's more of a scientific method applied to our practice. Here's an example of practitioner action research. So you may be having, um, maybe you have a, a professional learning community or just a group of teachers that you talk to during the break over the water cooler, okay? But together you started wondering, you, you've heard about problem-based learning and you're curious, you want to know more about this and you, you're wondering if this will increase learning outcomes for students who want to go into business, for example. You have a lot of students who you've gotten to know early in the class and it's just a coincidence that Several of the class uh, students in your class, they're, they're interested in small home businesses or studying business in the future, okay? So you're wondering, hmm, how could I help these students? I know that in business, there, there are a lot of problems to solve. So what is this problem-based learning? So you and your, your peers, you get together and review the literature you find out about action research and you learn more about problem-based learning. You do some searching online, you find out some, you know, how to set up that process, what it is, and you decide to, to implement a, a lesson plan and actually do more problem-based learning in your classes. Then you see, hey, does this help students? And I'm bringing in student interest and engagement because I'm bringing in some scenarios from the business world. So I'm going to then measure and document the learning results and use a couple of questionnaires um, that I have students fill out before I start the problem-based learning lessons and after to see you know, their reactions anecdotally, the, the more qualitative you know, um, sort of data. Um, but then I can also go to quantitative data to see if that increased student engagement, student persistence, student outcomes as well, right? So comparing what I wasn't doing in the past to what I have implemented. And so um, perhaps then the teachers involved in this, they would find out that the approach resulted in significant learning um, gains as well as learner satisfaction. When I ask students, you know, did you like those problem scenarios that you were working on um, with your classmates? And they say, yes, this really helped me understand how to solve business problems, okay? So that would be one example. So what we're going to have you do is as follows. We're going to be putting you in breakout rooms. Before that, I'm going to go ahead and share a, um, a file in the chat. So give me one moment to upload that. And this file, um, I'm gonna ask you to open it. When you get to your breakout room, if there's someone in your group who would like to share their screen, um, you're welcome to do that. And um, let, me, let me get this ready. One moment. Um, Hannah or um, Giovanna, are you able to put the handout part one in the chat real quick? So yes, I'm working thank on that. You. Thanks for coming to the rescue. Um, you're going to, um, as soon as that is uploaded to the chat, you're going to click on the PAR Practitioner Action Research handout in the chat and open it. We'll be sending you to breakout rooms with um, a couple of colleagues here in the webinar. And you're briefly going to share in the group your ideas for implementing a strategy for PAR. So you remember a little, just a short time ago, you chose maybe scaffolding or you chose goal setting or one of those strategies that was listed, you annotated. So what you're going to do is share your ideas for how you would implement some research, action classroom-based research to see 
if if you started scaffolding the lessons better by maybe having students do a pre-test to find out what they know ahead of time um and then seeing if that that um starting where students are and scaffolding lessons better would be um, helpful for students. So thank you. Giovanna has put the link in the chat. If you can go ahead and click on that. Um, and it, let me make sure. Okay. And what you're going to do is um, answer these questions in your group. So what is an issue of concern in your class, in your agency? Okay. So my issue of concern is, wow, we're almost to the end of the term and a couple of students stopped coming and I don't know what happened, okay? So what is my research question? Maybe my research question is, um, will, will personal messaging to those students bring them back to class and help them stay in the class to the end? Um, so that could be my action research question. So that that's also my intervention, personal messaging. So first I'll try email. Although I know that's not the most effective, that that how it hasn't always worked. And if I don't get a response to an email, um, we have a text messaging system in our school. I'll send a personal text message to find out um, we've missed you in class. Is there something I can do to help you finish out this term? Um, if they if I don't get a response to the text message, maybe my <laughs> my third thing will be a personal phone call. Okay, so that's my intervention. And what data will you collect? Well, I'll see, you know, in the past when students just dropped away towards the end, I just figured, well, they're too busy or the class is not interesting. I didn't really know their reasons for dropping away. So I will collect data about how, um, well, I'll collect data about the reasons why they stopped coming towards the end of class. Was it that suddenly their work schedules changed or maybe there was something um, I could do, you know, to help them. Maybe um, I was going too fast in my pacing. Okay. So I will ask students specifically what happened, you know, no judgment of them and um, I, I won't take it personally. And then I predict that this more personal interven intervention, if I continue that in the future, the students are not going to be dropping towards the end of the class. That's what, that's my prediction that I will have greater overall um, retention of students in my class. So that's an example, just walking you through that. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and put you into breakout rooms. And um, you have the questions on the handout as well. We're going to give you about 10 minutes to discuss what is an issue how could you formulate a research question? Um, you know, this is just very preliminary, okay? Just sharing some ideas. You're not tied to anything you say in your breakout rooms, okay? So are there any questions before we open up the breakout rooms? Okay, so here we go. Thank you very much. And we'll send you there for about 10 minutes. Should I send them now, Christy? Sure, thank you. Go ahead and open up. Hi everyone, for those of you that are still here, please click uh, to join the room that you've been assigned to. I still have Elena, Shanice, and Eileen that are still here, if you could please just uh, click the joy button so that way you can join the breakout room and participate in the discussion. Thank you.
All right, so we're just waiting for a few folks to come back from the breakout rooms. Um, what you can do now, if you would like to go to the chat, there is a second handout to click on and um, download to your um, desktop. And everybody should be coming back in about 10 seconds. Okay, well, thank you for discussing what may, may be some issues um, that you or your agency have been um, experiencing regarding student motivation and persistence, at, attendance, retention, and so on. And hopefully you tossed around some ideas with your um, colleagues in the breakout rooms. Um, I think that's usually the most valuable thing of professional development, getting a chance to speak with others who are doing the legwork like you all are. So hopefully you found that, um, that discussion useful. And so what we'd like to do is talk a little bit about next steps. So if you can go to the chat, go ahead and click on the chat, and we have a second handout um, called Next Steps for you to click on and download to your computer. And um, well, we're coming to the end of 2023. What a great time to make a resolution, right? Um, unfortunately, what I notice in my community, you've probably seen this, many people make a New Year's resolution, a goal for the new year. And uh, for example, the gyms are full. In January, the gyms in my area are just, you know, standing room only waiting for a machine. And by a month later, it's back to normal. So following the research-based uh, suggested practice for goal setting made a goal made publicly, a goal written down and a goal with steps like a smart plan, a smart uh, goal plan will help you hopefully implement something you have learned through this community of practice time um, to identify something you want to implement, to think about the steps you'll go through, to put it into practice and not just stop there, but really gauge the effect. So that second handout is something that we would like for you to write down that goal, talk to a fellow colleague about that goal. So just like our students, when we go through these steps of goal creation, um, making them happen will become more of a reality. So that handout that you uh, downloaded is your goal planning form, hopefully for implementing a strategy to help your students motivate and finish your courses for the coming year. So we look forward to hearing how you have implemented your invent, um, interventions, um, what works with your adult learners. Why not take the extra step of not just implementing a strategy, but actually doing some action-based research, collecting that data, analyzing that data and sharing it with the rest of the adult education field. We need to do more to learn from each other than just be in silos in our classroom. So please think about that. And for now, I'll go ahead and turn it over to Hannah Schlosser from Lynx for some final information about Lynx. So Hannah, you can just tell me next when you want me to advance the slides. Thanks so much, Christy, and just a huge thank you in general to Christy for leading not only today's webinar, but also our kickoff webinar about a month ago, and for being in the community of practice with us as well. We so appreciate your facilitator skills and for sharing your expertise with us, Christy. It's, it's much appreciated. I just want to take the last couple of minutes to remind you about some of the great resources that are available through links. So Christy, if you could go to the next slide. So we talked about links in our first webinar. And we just want to remind you that links is a space that is open and free available to you at all times. Um, the direct link is on the slide there for you. There are lots of reasons to visit links. You can get resources there. You can participate in additional trainings at your own pace. You can join communities of practice. 
And it's even a space where you can invite learners to come in and do some of the additional remote learning on their own as well, or in ways that enhance their experiences in the classroom. As you can see on this slide, this is a reminder of all the different ways that links can support you. We have a resource collection, a learner center, a community of practice, which you are engaging in through this particular training, a learning portal, again, which you had the opportunity to experience through this training with the Motivating Adult Learners course, and a professional development center, which is mainly for the state, which is how we all came to be here with you today. So huge thank you to Greg and the Florida team for inviting us. It's been um, wonderful to be able to work with some of the adult educators in the state of Florida. Um, I'm gonna have you go to the next slide, Christy. So in addition to our contact information, I also wanna share in the chat the link to the final evaluation. If you could just take a moment to follow that link and then once you get there, it's a survey. The title of this training opportunity is Motivating Adult Learners to Persist. And then the primary presenter is Christy Reyes. And then you can just fill out the evaluation from there. Again, on this slide, you see our contact information if you need to re reach out to either Christy or myself. You also see a reminder about how to get to the links website, or if you're ever having any issues accessing any of those links resources, the informational um, help desk is there, their contact information is there as well. So again, thank you so much. We appreciate you and hope you have a wonderful holiday season. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Good luck with your motivation strategies. You can do it. <laughs> thank you.